Welcome back to the Dropping In Surf Show. My name is Rob Case. I am a paddling technique coach operating out of Northern California. I'm honored to be joined today by Matt Warshaw, the masterful historian of surfing. The countless hours he's put in to provide us with a library of historical accounts and photos and videos, it goes above and beyond a normal job. He was kind enough to share some of his time to join me to discuss how science fits in or has fit in the history of surfing. We find Matt stuck in Hawaii on the North Shore, isolating after a positive COVID test. He'd like me to apologize for any COVID brain hiccups on his part, but all I witnessed was pure genius. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Matt Warshaw, and please go subscribe to the Encyclopedia of Surfing so that Matt can continue to chronicle our wonderful surfing history. His work is extremely high quality and important for posterity, and he asks so little of us. Let's be good stewards and support this worthy endeavor. Well, could definitely be in worse places. That's pretty awesome timing. Definitely. Yeah. On the other one- hand, look, at you're stuck with me, and not only am I unprepared as I usually am, but I'm unprepared with the virus. So uh, I get the editing get your editing skills ready. This is going to be, uh, I don't know what we're going to talk about or how this is going to go. Yeah. Now our show is pretty casual. Um, we try to focus on topics around the science and math within surfing and try to mix those two together, but we get off topic a okay. lot. Um, what, what I thought we could talk about, cause I, I hadn't really thought about this too much um, in, in my studies uh, of, of paddling, especially, but I've never really thought of going through this thought process of talking about history of math and science within surfing, because for me, I think the culture didn't really dictate growing up. Like you didn't really, you didn't, we didn't have coaches, you didn't have coaches, you know, and science wasn't really thought of in a formal manner in surfing. But if you, as I started thinking about it, I thought, man, there's a ton of science within surfing history. Um, so I figured who's who better to talk to about history than you. There's uh, two things come to mind. First of all, you're, you're right. And we met at surf simply, right? You and yeah. I. Mm-hmm. And so that's a place that is trying to bring some sort of rigor and some, um, some order to a process. I don't know if they're bringing, I guess they're bringing science to it, to a process that, you know, traditionally has just been, certainly was true for me. Um, somebody, you get a board somehow and someone points you to the beginner's break mm-hmm. and you, you put in the 10,000 hours, like they say, right? And I still think that there's no, that 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 is still essential to whatever we're going to do as surfers in terms of getting better, um, that you, you go out and you, you watch somebody who's better than you and you try to do what they're doing. You, you know, you, that, that, I still feel like that is the the number one, that's the best, um, piece of advice I would ever give anybody was you just have to the best piece of advice to give someone surfing is uh, be 10 years old and and have months of time in front of you where you can do it. And I think facetiously, but the point is you need a lot of time and you need to just be out in the water. There's nothing, there's no substitute for just water time. Um, I, and, and, but that, you know, that's a guy I'm 62 and that's, you know, so I didn't have any of the thing that, I don't know if I would have availed myself of the kind of things that you do, the kind of things that surf simply does. I probably would have, because I always wanted to go forward as fast as I could. Um, but there was no, yeah, there was, and there wasn't much science involved in the sport that I can remember getting my hands into when I started in 1968, but there Science had come to the sport in in two ways with with boards, of course, and I'm thinking here especially of Bob Simmons, who um, 
was I think a Cal, Pal, a Cal Poly math grad, or at least he went, you know, anyway, he was, he was so deep into uh, numbers and, and, and formula and everything that it probably, I mean, at some point it was good for the boards he was making, but at some point I think he, he almost ignored just sort of what was happening, how the boards were working because he would, the formula, the, the, the numbers would dictate everything that he was doing. And there's a whole, there was a whole sort of dichotomy between Bob Simmons, the genius, the man armed with math and science, and then Dale Velzi, who did everything, the, you know, the, the surfing cowboy who did everything by feel, mm -hmm. everything. And he like, he couldn't, he would just look up at, at Simmons and say, what are you talking about? Bob, I have no, just quit, take that, you know, and, 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 you know, he, Sim, uh, Velzi would make a board and go write it and come back in and just say, I, you know, it, it needs more, it needs to be softer here, more curve here. And, you know, he, I don't think, you know, if he could do division, I would be surprised. So there, but, but Simmons was, would literally, I think, just draw out formula all about, and I can't think of, there's a, there's a, there was a, there was a famous book on hulls and and how boats went through water that was his bible that he believed yeah. could all be applied to surfing which i don't think is true but it was put him on the right track you know but simmons was so deep into science really early on and that also extended to how, how he felt about he knew i think more than most people did about the science of of storms and waves and all that and bathymetry but the other guy I wanted to mention, and this, let me see if my COVID brain will allow me to um, pull the name out. I think Walter Monk from Scripps yep. was doing a lot of things with the science of storms and wave formation. And right. who's the other guy who wrote Waves and Beaches, that book? It's so good. Um, again, I'm, this is just, I'm, I'm foggy in the head, but there was some science being done with regard to um, uh, swells, storms, wave formation, period, height, all that kind of stuff. That interestingly was all there and available for a lot of years before surfers got around to finally picking it up and going, oh, this, maybe waves don't come from earthquakes from the far east, you know, because <laughs> if you read Gidget, it's pretty funny. I love that book, a much better book than a movie. But there's a little scene in Gidget where, you know, one of the surfers is talking about where waves come from. And it's, you know, oh, there was a it was a big shaker. And, oh, we're going to get more surf this year because of all the nuclear testing. And it's all this just crazy <laughs> ass stuff. And, you know, oh, the surf's going to really come up because of the tide and da, da, da. And that was probably pretty accurate in terms of what people thought of. Yeah. Science wise, with regard like to wave science at the time, even though there was already there, since World War II, there have already been books about, you know, how waves are formed and stuff. So another case of surfers maybe being a little slow on the uptake, uh, you know, on the science. Yeah, it's you're talking about really formalized scientific method um, with the rigor that we see in today's universities. And I, I would also say that that there's another kind of more casual kind of science that that um, that has been done since the very beginning of, of surfing um, in that it's trial and error, it's testing, mm. it's proving and disproving things. And sure. And if you look at, you know, guys like Grubby Clark, you know, I don't think he had much of a degree, but he figured out how to make foam and make good foam that, right. you know, is, is, is used. So it's almost science was born casually or, or informally out of necessity um, and merging what you're talking about with Velzi with a, a Simmons. Simmons was just putting words and putting calculations around what Velzi already knew uh, in a way. That's, that's right. And, and it's funny with Simmons, there was a real limitations because Simmons was so convinced that the, that the formula that, the, that, that you could plot it all out that it got in his way. Mm -hmm. Um, Simmons also had that, um, had the bad arm. And so, so Simmons was making boards, um, for him, for himself. 
And also Simmons didn't really want to turn. Simmons wanted just to go fast. Everybody else, as soon as the turning was a thing, wanted to turn, right? So Simmons reading these books that he had on, on, on hydrodynamics was, I think, mostly just trying to build a board that would go as fast as possible from the, uh, the top of the point at Malibu to the pier. Mm -hmm. And he did, he made some boards that went faster than other boards, I suppose. Although something that goes faster on a straight line, I mean, again, I'm no scientist, but you know, if you're, you're actually going faster, if you've got a board that turns, because if you could take the guy who's turning and take his line, it's gonna stretch out to be a longer line than the one Bob took going straight. Yeah. Um, so Simmons was, was the smartest guy involved in board design then and maybe ever, uh, but he was pursuing a pretty individual um, particular uh, track and, and the boards that Velzi made and then later on the boards that um, uh, Joe Quigg and Kivlin and Tommy Zahn made were um, much closer or much more important or much, I should say, the real antecedents to what we ended up with in terms of board design. So Simmons boards, Simmons did some things with uh, foiled rails and a little bit of lift that were really important that arguably you couldn't have gotten the next level, the next set of boards without that. Although I think somebody else would have thought of that. But Quig in particular, I think is the guy that I tend to think of as um, uh, the, the person who put surfing on the track that it sort of is now. Before that, it was planks and hollow boards. And, and you know, I don't know what, I don't know what Joe Quig thought of. I don't know how, you know, I think he was more like Velzi, where he was, you'd, you'd make a board and you'd, you'd go try it. I mean, he had a, you know, one of his best designs was he had a dream of riding away from beyond the river mouth at Rincon all the way to the to Highway 101. <laughs> and in that dream, somehow he came out of that dream and what he decided to do was to take, you know, to take a board and to remove I think two inches like where the stringer would have been. I don't think it had a stringer. And to just to close the board up. So we just ended up with a narrower, more rocket-like board. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's not science. That's he's, he's he had a vision, you know, yeah, right. and that board ended up working great. It became a pintail. And it, you, you can see a sketch of that board. And so there's Joe Quigg going, uh, you know, entirely on sort of intuition. I had a dream. I woke up, I cut this big strip out of my board and it went great. <laughs> and so, you know, I don't know, Simmons, that would have probably just, Simmons would have just, that would have blown his head off. He would have been so, <laughs> that doesn't matter. Where's the numbers? Where's the formula? So, what, about like, uh, what about a guy like, what about a guy like what about a guy like Hobie? Was he scientifically minded? I mean, he was more business. You said Simmons was more um, driven for his own gain. And yeah, Hobie was I don't really trying of, to do more. Right. I don't know that Hobie, I, I'm trying to think of what Hobie's contribution to me wasn't, didn't have much to do with um, design or uh, Hobie's contribution had to do with, um, he didn't invent the first surf shop, but um, it was, it was, he was, he was a good marketer. He was a good, um, you know, he was a good uh, business. He was a good CEO, you know. Hobie just hired, you know, maybe his best skill of all was he hired great people. Mm -hmm. And he just kept that big ship, Hobie surfboards and all the other spinoffs. He just kept the thing. That's really unfair. I shouldn't say that. He was really, he did have ideas. He, uh, you know, he had some ideas with regards to gliders, um, he did have ideas. He liked to work on things. Um, but I tend to think of Hobie as being, I mean, I, I think he's been called like the, you know, the Henry Ford of surfboard manufacturing. He figured out how to make more boards faster than other people. Right. I'm always surprised at how few boards it actually was when you go back and you think, oh, there was a surf boom going on. And, you know, you find out that Hobie made 
on his best year, you know, 7,000 boards or something. It was all, the numbers were always a lot smaller than I, I could be wrong about that number, but I'm, I was always, I'm always surprised at how, you know, it wasn't millions of boards. It was thousands of boards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or the, another way, the other person to talk about it would be Greeno. You know, I mean, Greeno, you know, probably did more for surfboards. If, if you count in the, if you count in inspiring others to move in the right direction, Greeno did more for surfboards than modern performance surfboards than anybody. And again, you know, one of his, one of his breakthrough ideas was to look at a, uh, a tuna or a marlin or something. I forget what kind of fish it was. And he was looking at, you know, the tail fin and go, Oh, I'm going to take that tail. Fin. And I think he might, he was such a fisherman, you know, he probably, I mean, he killed a, a fish, a tuna, a marlin or something, you know, flipped it upside down and basically made a surfboard fin from that. So yeah. um, that's like, like Joe Quig waking up from a dream. You just sort of, you go with what inspires you. And I think they all had a lot of misfires too, but the things that did work for those guys that weren't scientific when they worked, they, they worked. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, going back to science really is having an idea like that, testing it out. And really this, the, the more rigorous scientific method would be someone coming along and saying, well, that that's not proven because I've just disproved that. And it's because of this, for example. So, well, and, the, and the other thing I should go to going back to Greeno is that he had that one fin and it worked and he just kept modifying it. So yeah. there was all these stories where when Nat Young went and won the 1966 world titles, he was riding a board that the famous board called Sam that he had made, but Nat was always really careful or really gracious and quick to say it had a greeno fin so nat made the board but the if you'll remember those you know the longboard fins up until the mid 60s were those big clunky they used to yeah. call them d fins defense yeah which you know every time i think of how obstinate surfers can be and how stuck in their ways they are it's how long the sport stuck with that big anchor of a fin sitting on the back of the board. Like what a, it doesn't get cited that often, but you know, making a smaller narrow based rake back fin. And I don't know if Greeno invented that idea, but he certainly did the most with it. Mm -hmm. If any one thing changed how boards work, I mean, that would be in the top, you know, we talk about the shortboard revolution, but before that happened, that nice narrow based, rake back fin was really a big the the d fin was I, I, I don't you know where did that come from boats don't like it just seems like the weirdest the one of the real mistakes that surf design out of surf design so the d fin was i think already on its way out by the time uh greeno did that that rake back fin but um somebody i was talking with was saying his main recollection of the 1966 world titles was Nat Young and Greeno in between heats sanding the fin. They just kept refining the fin throughout the contest. So <laughs> George and Nat and all those guys, when they'd have an idea, the idea didn't just take, they were always, always, always refining it. Yeah, and always testing it and, you know, so I don't know if that's, I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I'm, now I'm getting confused at what the definition of sort of science is mm -hmm. and the way we're using it because it doesn't seem like scientific. It just seems like you're going to take something the way anybody would. And if you've got the, the, that kind of mindset, you look at something and you go, well, that's pretty good, but how do I make it better? Right. Right. And that's the thing that, that what I think science is never just a set in stone kind of thing. It's always evolving. It's always moving on. And What's interesting about surfing in science is that they're, they're almost at odds a lot of times because surfing, at least in today's culture, is driven through marketing. You look at, you know, look at the marketing that you receive all the time on boards, right? Oh, and right. there's lots of keywords on, oh, yeah, this is a great, this, this is a perfect daily driver. Well, how do you know how I surf? It might not be a good daily driver. For right. You, right. And right. what's really interesting, if you look at 
all the other sports, you got golf, you got tennis. There's so much science driven behind even the marketing, right? This is, this has been proven to hit the ball farther with this club head. Right. And they've done test after test after test. Why do you think surfers or surf culture is so slow to adopt something like that? Well, maybe if, if you're, if you, if you want to hit a good tee shot, the only thing that you care about is how far the ball goes. Mm-hmm. So this, you know, it, all this stuff gets back to how unique surfing is as a, in the, in the world of sport and how sometimes when I think about encyclopedia of surfing, like, what am I doing with this? And it just seems like the overarching thing is to continue to kind of keep it away from the rest of sport because it is so different, but like a driver is meant to hit a, a ball far. And that's all that that's kind of all that counts. And 10 of us going surfing on a, on a three foot day, all 10 of us might want to get something a little different out of that surf. So there's no way to market to us 10 people. There isn't a particular right way to ride. You know, I mean, if it's, if it's eight foot pipeline, the thing that you want to, there's a certain thing that wherever everyone's trying to do, but if, you know, on an, a different day, a small, a, 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 a chest high day in, in, in a nice fun beach break somewhere, um, 10 people might want to ride that day in 10 different, slightly different ways. Right. Um, so, um, so it's purpose driven. Well, I'd say it's, I'd say it's just sort of individually driven, like, like, yeah, a daily driver. That doesn't, you're right. That doesn't mean anything to somebody who wants to, who's really, I, I was just got out of the water and there was a long, I was at a cami land. There was a long border out and I'm riding like a, I'm still not feeling up to strength. So I was riding sort of a seven two, double step up full, kind of a full board that I would ride in a, and another guy was out there riding a little tiny fish, right? So, um, and again, it was head high, soft reef waves. So there's no daily driver for the three of us. This guy's got his thing and I've got mine and the other guy has his thing. Yes. I mean, the science, the, the, so the board, the board stuff, um, yeah, the marketing takes over because, but the, the science stuff just to, just to hang a right here real quick would be to me where you're, there isn't much too much argument would be on the, you know, what's when I wake up, the first thing I want to know is what direction is the swell coming from and what's it going to be doing. And all those numbers are pretty solid. Like there's not much, well, there's, yeah. So, As, so in terms you know, of how, what we know t- it, using today's technology, that is, that is our belief, right? That, that the swell forecasts, the wind, all that is, is actually during, but how many times have you showed up to the beach and that's been wrong, right? So it may be beyond when we're, we've passed, they're going to come up with better technology for, for weather forecasts. That's for know? sure. But it doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't um, negate that science maybe doesn't like, um, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that the, I put, you can put, you can really sort of set your, you, every, all of us are looking at the same numbers to figure out where the surf's going to go. And it, it is true that the, that, that the, our ability to, um, to the accuracy of all that, while it's getting better all the time, still doesn't come through, but, but there's no, there's no gainsaying the, the importance of science when it comes to all the wave stuff. The surfboard stuff, I do kind of go, well, you know, don't maybe, you know, there is no perfect volume for a a surfer of my height and weight. It depends on what I want to do. So the numbers are all really soft and the numbers can be wrong. The weather related numbers can be wrong, but they're not, I mean, in other words, they can be inaccurate, but they're not, um, you can't say that's the wrong. um, You're just doing the best to get the, Right. I'm, I'm the sorry, science, the science behind it, you know, that there's high pressure and low pressure, and that is the science behind what you're talking about. Right. And so far that, that hasn't been disproven, but you know, so the forecasts and the models that they develop might not work 
as planned. Well, somebody but, might say, this is the, I've scientifically decided this is the board you should ride. And I said, well, yeah. I don't want to ride that board. That's not what I want to do. And, yeah. and somebody can't say, here's the best science I have for the swell today. I'm going to say, well, thank you. And I hope yeah. you're right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you totally. can't say, well, give me a different bit of, yeah. of science. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I bring this topic up because I, I, I've chatted with other um, scientists within the surf space and uh, they do a lot of great work that the surfing culture just hasn't really accepted yet. It's a lot of really useful stuff right now. CSU San Marcos is doing a lot of wetsuit studies, for example, mm-hmm. and these studies are showing exactly where we lose the most heat. Um, and some of these wetsuits aren't designed to right. combat that. Right. Why? Right. Well, well, they don't know. They don't understand why that research is just kind of be pushed aside yet. And I think in time, I think in time we'll all kind of come around. Um, but it goes back to, you know, Velzi feeling something out. I think each of us as individual surfers need to feel out. Does it work for me as an individual? Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's, I think that's right too. It, it, and you're right. There is a, there's an, a special, there is a special sort of um, pressure. And I still feel it even at my age to like ride a board, you know, to ride, to not ride an uncool board. And the hardest I pushed back on that was um, not long before I left San Francisco. So that was 2011. Um, but at some point I had ridden a surf tech, a, you know, a pop out. Um, it was an Al Merrick flyer two. Uh-huh. I think what had happened is our son had just been born and we were, we were actually going on a few trips with the family and, you know, the best thing about not surfing as much as I used to and not caring as much as I used to is one of the best things is no longer, I don't travel with boards anymore. I just borrow or, and at one point, anyway, we went to um, Costa Rica and I, I think I'd called ahead and I was riding, a, I think a 6.2 Surf Tech Flyer 2. And you, it was, I think the most common one. And and I just found out I could get the same board on the other end, right? And and so I love being able to just to go. It, but I also remember walking down to Ocean Beach with my uh, my pop out surfboard and hoping people wouldn't like see me. I was embarrassed. <laughs> Hi, I was, hiding you know, it until it got in the water. <laughs> and who? Why should I? You know, I don't. But I did care, and so you know, I still want the boards to look cool, and I still don't like riding a fun board. Mm-hmm. For no other reason than it's just stubbornness and, and and again wanting to still be cool. So the marketers, the marketers are are are, are it's a powerful force, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it brings us into kind of today's era of surf science, which it's still at its infancy. And and when I say surf science, it's more of the rigorous academic one that you and I kind of think about in our heads versus the casual kind of science. And I'm looking at some notes I took, there was a, a bit, pretty big surge in studies that I was looking for um, around the 2012, 2010, 2012 era. Um, but that wasn't the earliest science that, that had been done or at least attempted to be done. Um, it goes back um, when I first started studying paddling or swim technique um, was back in 1999. And back then, there was really only swim research that goes back to the sixties. So I used a lot of that as kind of my basis. And then all of a sudden in 2001, 2005, um, a bunch of research came out of uh, university of Western Australia, Griffith university, a lot of Australia driven. Um, And then even older than that, 1991 Southern cross university, once again, in Australia uh, was studying heart rates and energy expenditure and surfers. And then the earliest I could find, which blew my mind when I found it, was 1984. There was a study done at a Philip Institute of Technology, the Physiological Assessment of Surfers. And that was the earliest I could find in terms of an academic paper. And and now I'm seeing it more and more, 17, 18, 19, there's papers left and right. I think when you look at kind of just the history of that little gap from 84 to today, and really the bulk of it kind of came in 2010 and on 
it's just a bunch of surfers that were like, you're making me do a thesis. All right. Well, right. I like surfing. And so let's try to apply this. And that kind of, it's, it's fascinating for me to see kind of that, that beginning, that origin of people starting to think that way, because from you know 1999, there was almost nothing. And to today, there's, there's a lot more to look at and test and, and we're still very much in, in its infancy. And I always compare it to swim research, which has been 60 years in the making um, and is still kind of evolving. Uh, that's but, back to the, that's back to the thing a little bit about, um, about um, the driver, I suppose, like the, 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 you know, getting a good golf club, which is that swimming competitive swimming is there's nothing more than time is everything right mm -hmm. i mean it's all about how you finish and that and surfers will never i think i um uh it, it, there's no there's no there isn't a there isn't a, a thing that you're unless you're on the world tour i suppose there isn't you know everyone serves for different reasons and has their own um definition of what success is or what a good day surfing is. And yeah. And that can even change from day to day for a certain person. So a, an old guy who's coming out of COVID might go out and get one wave and feel like that's a, that's a, that's a success. I've had a good day surfing where yeah. the same guy last week might say, God, I only got one wave. What a, what a coup. Yeah. So, um, the metric is the metrics, metrics and, uh, and money drive the research at the end of the day. I mean, you look at swimming, there's a lot of money in swimming. There's a lot of money in golf. Right. Um, right. And, and the main, and there's a lot of people in those sports. Right. So you can, you can use the science to market, but it's, it's, you have metrics that are defined. Whereas what you're saying is that in surfing, there's not really a defined metric for riding a wave. You can ride it however you want. But you're not selling. I don't think it, it doesn't seem to me that ultimately what you're doing, Rob, is is a, about a metric. It's about a, 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 it's about efficiency. Like you're not trying to get someone necessarily to improve a time. You want them to be able to surf longer. You want them to be able to catch more waves. Yeah. And so I'm that's my metric. Of, yeah. What's that? Well, there that's you go. My, that's that, that's that, my metric. Right. That's my, right. my my metric. But, 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 you're right. but to, you're right. to your point, to your point, there's no gold medal in paddle. And I tell people that all the time. Right. right. And so I might teach somebody, Hey, you know what? There's use a lower gear in your paddling get out just, you know, a few seconds slower, but you're going right. to save a ton of energy. Right. And they're like, okay, cool. I'm cool with that. But in swimming, that's a no, no. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. It's funny. Um, because I only serve three or four times a year. And I remember when we moved, to Seattle from San Francisco, I was so sure that where the, where the, uh, where I was going to just fall off the cliff was paddling because that would just seem, I wasn't up until that point, I was paddling, I don't know, 10 or 20 hours a week you know, for, I did that for years and years and years. And it was, and here I am, you know, 10 years where I've essentially been retired and I am constantly frustrated and uh, disappointed and cringy about um, my pop up, my, what I can do on a wave. Mm. And I am on the other side, amazed and delighted that the thing that comes back to me the fastest is... Um, uh, a kind of a cruise level. I, I, I don't have a paddle burst like I used to, but getting onto the beach and paddling whatever a few hundred yards out to Cami land, I can do that at a level that I automatically regulate to get out there without being winded. So, yeah. and I can, you know, the, the fact that my, my paddling uh, has stayed with me more, I think is probably more important than my surfing itself because it means that i'm not done before i even start i'm sitting in a lineup after a few minutes feeling okay well let's now let's move on to the next thing but the that fundamental thing that so that everything else is built on yeah which i watched you teach people like you know the 
being able to just put myself into that, I guess it's sort of a second gear to get out for a two or 300 yard paddle yeah. is a hundred percent intact. And it, I just never would have guessed that would be the case. Yeah. You know? When did you start surfing again? At what age? Eight. Yeah. So that has a big part of it. If, if uh, not to get off the topic of history, but if you look at anybody that's been in the water before the age 12, 13, and if they're in the water enough, they will begin to figure out how to move through water efficiently and effectively. hundred you know? percent. So the, the, to that same thing, it's so, it's so interesting because my son, who, who I don't think is going to be a surfer, he's 12, but he does like just to, he, he's, he's always like when we visit the beach, he just likes to put his feet in and run in to surf, run out, jump over waves that, uh, you know, he feels what everybody, but, but uh, this trip, he said, dad, let's go body surfing. Let me teach me how to body surf. And I said, oh, this will, that is great. I've been wanting to hear that. It'd be so fun. Water's warm. We had some gentle sort of shore breaky waves. And uh, I've been body surfing since I was, you know, six or something. And um, uh, I didn't realize until I was trying to teach him how ridiculously hard it is <laughs> to catch a wave a small wave, just you know, standing in waist deep water because I can do it as easy as I can get up and walk over here and shut the door. I, I can just jump into a wave and get to the beach because it's, this is just like what you're saying. If you spend enough time in the water um, or if you spend enough time paddling, like I learned this morning, I, there, it's, it's unlike, I, I, don't, I, don't, I wish my pop-up was the same way. You know, that seems to just be disappearing from me for whatever, for reasons I can't quite figure out. But parts of being in the water, body surfing and paddling, swimming, seem to be, uh, come, to e come as easy to me and seem to be as ingrained in me as just getting up off a chair and walking. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's interesting you bring that up because I, <clears throat> I always look at like John Florence, paddling and it's so natural and it's, it's it's something that he's been doing his whole life since very young right it's just every day after school he's in the water and that got me into seeing differences and this is again something that's very specific to me but i see differences in paddling technique by region oh really and i found this really interesting like so how does how does that get passed down because you know there i wasn't around i wasn't teaching people how to do it how does something like that get passed down? So there's Southern California paddle stroke. There's a Santa Cruz paddle stroke. There's an Australia paddle stroke. There's a Hawaii paddle stroke. And it's fascinating to watch these differences. And, and these are generalized right, right. observations that I've made. And it, it, to me, I'm trying to figure out the why, like what, wh how does something like that get formed? Well, it, it's from what you started with our conversation. You're watching them, you're observing others in the lineup and you're replicating them and mm -hmm. not just when they're riding, but also when they're paddling, mm -hmm. you might even get to the point where you're in the lineup so often that the older folks are, or, or other surfers are telling you, yeah, you should paddle this way, or you should take off this way, or you should right. ride this way. And that knowledge get passed on and passed on. And through, through repetition and repetition and repetition, it becomes ingrained in that region. Right. Interesting. And it's yeah. almost scientific in that its own little way. And then right. someone from the outside comes and says, actually, there's a better way or, or, or actually this Australia crawl stroke is better or the Hawaii way is better or, you know, it, and that's where science would be that kind of foundational base to say, well, science says this, you can do it however you want, but this is what science says. What about the possibility that, that it, you know, some kind of a, a Hawaiian paddle stroke is best for here and maybe a, an Australian paddle stroke is best for surfing the Gold Coast. Is that, a, you think that there's like a regional thing or do you think there's actually nope. a, a it's, sub it's more passed down and cultural based. Like if you look at the Australian paddle stroke, it, it is driven more from swimming than anything else from, nice. from, from competitive and formal swimming. Right. And if you look at the Australian culture, they have these swim derbies all the time when people are growing up. It's, it's a very, popular thing. Whereas in California, we didn't, I mean, swimming is big, but it's not that big. Right. Um, and then you look at Southern California, specifically the San Clemente area, I call it the San Clemente paddle because it's just such a high back arch and right. it's, it's really proud paddle. Um, and that was just passed on just by observation. 
Right. This is how you paddle. And when I talk to people from these regions, I'm like, so, so how did you learn how to paddle? How'd you learn how to surf? Oh, this is what they told me. I always start right. my sessions with what, do you have any just dying questions about paddling? Oh yeah. I've always been told this. I've always wondered if that's right. And I never really say that something's right or wrong. Cause even the science of what I've found, it's not there yet, uh, but I say, this is what, the, these are what the facts say. Right. And right. You decide whether it's good for you. Right. Um, the one in the Hawaii one is, is probably the most interesting one because they are the most affluent in the ocean, in the water environment, because they're in the water and they learn it naturally that way. And it just goes back to John, John, John is a perfect example of that, but a lot of the Hawaiian culture is, Hey, we're going to go in the water from a very early age. Right. And again, going back to that, that's probably the best teacher you can, you can have is just to put Teddy in the water over and over again. Right. That's right. I was just watching Mason Ho's latest video. And uh, even though he's in Scotland doing his weird. Oh, I saw that the slabby thing. Yeah. I mean, nobody, but somebody, I don't think anybody except a Hawaiian could be, just because of what you're saying, I mean, Mason Ho has probably been in the water. Well, I mean, he probably never wasn't in the water. He was probably in the water from when he was in utero. And so, yeah. and, and so I, I, I will never, you know, even the, all this said, I'll never understand how come we haven't seen the episode where he, um, we have to look at his face split in two. It just doesn't make, it's so nuts. Yeah. But, but I think it speaks exactly to what you're saying that if you, whatever level of comfort I have from being in the water since I was a kid, he has at times 500. Uh, Cause it's not just Sandy beaches of California, but his running around. I was watching some kids. He grew up at, I think it's sunset point. You've been you've been to Sunset Point before, and yeah. there's these reefs in between the point and the parking lot, and these kids will are literally playing on these reefs. And there's this one place where you can sort of stand on this reef, and it dips down a little bit, and a wave will come up, and you can ride the backwash over reef to the incoming wave, and they just smash and go up. And then they take, and it's like there were these six kids, boys and girls, probably all middle schoolers. And they were riding boogies and they were riding inflatables. And then they would take the inflatable and ride back to the reef and get smashed up. And like, this was all happening in an area that if I didn't see it, I'd say, God, I just want, I don't want, I just want to walk right around that. I don't know what want to be. And they were just playing in that on reef waves, going this way, going this way, up, down, da, da, da having the best time. And I was, I, I had this thought, I go, Oh, that's where Mason Ho got started with that. You, he started there and now he's yeah doing what he's doing. It's, yeah. you know, it's that uh, level of comfort. And I remember Chris Malloy once telling me about, um, I was saying, how come all you guys who surf pipeline a lot don't get hurt more than you do. And he said, because if you, you don't surf there very long without, you start to develop a sense of being underwater where you're almost like a, a salmon swimming upstream. So because it's hard for me to explain it to you, but when you're underwater, um, you're doing things without thinking about it to stay off, to stay off the reef. And he was likening, likening it to a, you know, a salmon just jumping over rocks and not getting hit. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a, I was thinking while you're talking about this is, is what you talked about at the very beginning, when you, when you, the advice you give to somebody when they first start surfing is the first thing you said was become a kid again. And these, these kids, they, they do all the trial and error and it's, it's actually the science behind the 10,000 hours. It's not 10,000, any hours, it's 10,000 good hours. And it's actually less than that. They've proven you can, you could do it in five if you're really focused on those hours. Right. Right. As a kid, you get through that learning cycle so quickly. It's like, boom, mistake, and then move on. Boom, mistake, move on. And then all of a sudden you're totally comfortable with it. And and, and, in in 2,000 hours, you have the equivalent of 40,000 hours for an adult. And so it's the plasticity of the brain. It it has to be very similar to the way you can learn languages at that age too. Yeah. It, It just comes, it just comes to you. And you see those, you see these kids really young, even these middle schoolers who are just um, you couldn't, 
I don't think you could teach anybody middle age to do what they were doing, even if they wanted to. Yeah. I don't think you can get that. And those kids are just doing the same thing Mason Ho does, which is that you just don't, without thinking about it, you just know how much water is here and how close I can get to the reef. Yeah. And, you know, you don't need that much water, but that's a hard thing to convince a person who's thinking about it. And if you're, if you're seven and you're seeing your big brother out there doing it, you're going to do it and you're going to get knocked around a little bit at the beginning and then you're going to pick it up and do what yeah. he's doing or she's yeah. doing. Yeah. That's why that's one of the things some of my clients were like, Hey, do you ever do any like skateboarding coaching? I'm like, no, 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 not for adults. Like yeah, definitely right? not. I mean, when I learned to skateboard, I would eat it so hard, but when you're right. lighter and smaller, right. the consequence wasn't all that bad. Now I eat it and my hips done for like three right. months. <laughs> no, skateboarding, you, you got to leave that behind when you graduate yeah. high school. I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's the same kind of concept, right? When you learn young, you know how to make a fall. I mean, I watch skateboarders absolutely eat it really hard. They know how right. to fall. Right. And I can't do that. And I'm, I'm going to stay in my lane in the water. <laughs> it's funny you bring that up because about six years ago, right when I got invited to go surf Kelly's wave, Kelly's uh, miracle wave, Kelly's monster. And I was super nervous about going to that pool and blowing. I, I was only going to get four waves. And I go, what am I going to do? I got to make sure I don't blow my waves. And I've made a lot of phone calls. And I also got on Amazon and got a skateboard. You know, I'm going to go ride the skateboard just so I can get back to you. Cause I'm, I'm in Seattle. I'm not going to go practice surfing. And so I went to my son's school. It's got a big flat uh, yard, a big flat playground with about a, you know, a one degree slant on it. And it turns out that I can still go down and skateboard and go, this is actually pretty fun. And at some point, you know, two or three weeks later, you know, whatever I hit, I hit a, I hit a rock going really slow, but still. And I fell and it was like you say, it was just shocking. I mean, it was so slow, but I fell and I thought, okay, and I just put it away for a while. I don't, I should. And then the next time I fell, I picked it back up. Uh, I, somehow subconsciously, I actually realized I still kind of actually know how to fall. There's, you know, there's a way to do it. You know, I fell hands first or did something. Yeah. And I got scraped up again a little bit and I'm not, I'm, I'm not out there skateboarding fast or often, but the ability to fall does stay with you, but I, it's, not, it's also nothing I really want to test on pavement too much, <laughs> but I was really happy that uh, I could still fall on the pavement at least. And I, I mean, you know, knock on wood, nothing broken, but. Um, but again, what, what, at what age did you start skateboarding? Five. Five. Yeah, exactly. So, so from, you know, like that 12, 13 and unders, it, that's the time that we implicitly learn through feel. I'm, I'm and, never um, more blown away. And I remember when Ben Ipa died, I was reminded of this. I'm never more blown away by that. Nothing seems to me to be a greater accomplishment than the guy or the woman who learns to surf relatively late in life. Like I think Ben Ipa started surfing like in, like when he was, uh, I want to say 18. Yeah. Hadn't Pat, Pat O'Connell started fairly late? Like I mid so. 16? Well, he, he grew up, he grew up in, the, in the Midwest or yeah. in the Great Lakes or something. Yeah. And it's fascinating. And, but so, so this gets to our point of, of, of neuroplasticity and the ability to learn as well is that even if you are past that kind of time frame, that, that 12, 13 bar, it's how well you can learn. There are some, going back to linguistics, there are some humans that just have this knack for languages, then they right. can speak five, six, seven languages, right. and they are like superhumans. And so if, if we were to kind of look at professional surfing or these, these guys that surf really well, they, are, they have that kind of talent. Plus they started young and now that's why there's just so refined right. with their movement. Right. It's incredible. Right. Yeah. Lucky for me, paddling is pretty easy to teach. <laughs> I feel bad for all the surf coaches out there. Like the guys that surf simply because it's a, once you're on your feet, it's hard to teach those little intricacies that you do with your feet and your ankles and, then, and your legs. And, you end up, and then you end up getting memed on the internet, like the, 
I don't know who who was <laughs> Sterling Spencer and the and uh, and the guy from uh, Sterling Spencer and the Raglan Surf Report guy or just oh yeah. You know? <laughs> they cracked me up, man. I know, but so I mean, that's what you end up. And, and you know what? The original. I'm, I don't. I don't know what they're. I don't know what specifically they're making fun of. Because, but it, yeah, that whole thing about learning how to do a bottom turn, like a pump turn on a skateboard, that those guys are making fun of. Mm-hmm. The funny thing about that is, whoever was doing that originally actually isn't wrong. Like there is a way to get on a skateboard and practice doing your thing. You know, yep. I mean, Gerlach probably will. T- will teach teaches that you know but it's also so ripe for um being made fun of and um you're doing something that in a way is just is as more just as important or more important but it's um uh it's it's uh, anti-memeing you can't really yeah. make you know peak paddling you, you can it can be done <laughs> uh, i remember i remember steve pesman at one point uh at one point during sort of the early Fernando Aguirre part of trying to get surfing to be an Olympic game, Steve Peasant at the journal just said, don't have surfing be in the Olympics, let it be its own thing. But go back to uh, paddle, go back to surfboard paddling. Paddling is the thing that should be an Olympic sport. Everyone, you know, everyone who surfs paddles have a thing where you can, you know, Paddle, you know, do a paddle race, do racing, sprint, yeah. you know, do that. Let that be the, uh, let that represent surfing the way it used to with the, you know, the Catalina race and all those other races they had mm-hmm. that were all won by surfers, you know? Yeah. So. It'd be boring to watch though, man. <laughs> I'd rather watch um, people paddle than to watch a, a surf contest in shitty ways. Yeah. I would. Because I, I guess because I, I I can always get into the Olympics. I can always I always can say oh you know how's the Canadian gonna I, I and where you know how many more laps and like and I uh, to watch uh, surf contest being held in in subpar waves like the finals at Bells. I just think you this is you're just making a mockery of this. Like you know none of these guys who were none of these guys who are surfing here. And again, I'm going to go back to Bells last week. None of these guys on the beach, nobody would be out in the water on this day unless you were offering points and money. So like what a, you know, where everybody, if you, you know, set up a paddle race and everyone's there to win, you know, nobody, yeah. everybody was there to win on, on the final stage at Bills only because that was in their contract. That was the points, that was the money on offer. But I, you know, I, it, it, def, it doesn't, it never feels right unless the surf's worth looking at to have a surf contest. But. Well, I think they, they say it a lot. Um, the, the, when we watch contests that the surfers are great and all, but it's the waves that are the feature. Right. You know, we, I tune in when the surf is really good. And then now right. I want to see really good surfers in those really good waves. But it all starts. Well, with, it, yeah, right. Know, or at things. least, or at least not be watching something that I don't know. I don't know why it's in my, it's in my mind that the baseline, like that, that the, the, the lowest common denominator should be that this is a spot. This is a day that all of these gathered surfers, men and women would on their own choose to surf. Like how, how's that for yeah. a bare, is that a bare minimum? Like, you know what, is this day good enough for these guys to want to surf yeah. on their own? Yeah, let's go. Let's have a, you know, yeah, and that, that could good. be just a fun air day. Yeah. It could be something, but you know, it's not, it's not, it's not bells at uh, waist high with a devil, offshore wind <laughs> anyway yeah. We, yeah. We from yeah yeah no but um why don't we wrap up i i gotta go get the kids anyway but yeah. thanks matt i appreciate it i hope that uh this was fun you know took your mind yeah. off of what you're dealing with <laughs> no no it, it is fun i was i was really looking forward to this well cool matt all right uh take care safe travels back and and uh we'll uh we'll talk when we can thanks bro. All right, it was fun you. thanks cheers man. bye